like to welcome all new arrivals to Ile de Besançon. Today, on the special arrival from Geneva, it's Dave Goodman, paging Dave Goodman. Hello, Internet, and welcome. Ellie calling again. Here we are once more on the beautiful Ile de Besançon, where somehow it remains early May all year round. Every Eurovision fan who comes here is only allowed to bring eight Eurovision songs for the duration of their stay, and here at the customs desk, we have to discuss why exactly it's that particular eight. There's also uh, some argument that for reasons to do with Sue Lawley, I also have to offer everybody a Eurovision-related luxury. The definition of that is a bit vague, but we will get to that when the time comes. Unlike other castaway destinations, we don't give you the Bible and Shakespeare. We give you Waterloo and Valare, which haven't inspired quite as many West End musicals. And here we have, in the Arrivals Lounge, a castaway... Could I take your name, please? Uh, my name's Dave Goodman. And what's your connection with the Eurovision Song Contest? Well, I have been an aficionado of the Song Contest for many years, but I now work for the organisers, the European Broadcasting Union, as a uh, communications officer in Geneva. Either at the heart of the dream or the belly of the beast, depending. <laughs> yeah, well, both. both. I mean, it was always a, an ambition of mine to, to work closely on the song contest. And uh, I've been a journalist all my life, worked in broadcasting, and to find my way to the EBU uh, five years ago was uh, yeah, a dream come true, and I'm very happy there. Awesome stuff. Let's get down to the paperwork. You've got some crackers here. So let's get into the first song. Normally the first song that people pick is their sort of Eurovision origin story. I couldn't guess at your age, but I don't think this is your Eurovision origin story. Our first record is Itreni de Tuzzo, Italy's 1984 entry by Franco Battiato and Alice. Yes. Well, this is actually my favourite Eurovision song of all time. And uh, when I mentioned this to a friend of mine, they, they said to me, that's rather pretentious of you. <laughs> rather pretentious? I didn't think it was that pretentious. Well, I think it's because it's an unusual Eurovision song. Franco Battiato, um, if you know him, is sort of, I don't know, I'm probably misdescribing, the Serge Gainsbourg of Italy. He's very avant-garde. And uh, Alice, or Alice, as it's, as it's pronounced in Italian, worked Oops. very closely with... Um, uh, I, I don't speak Italian, but I follow their, their careers, and I really like Italian music from that era, from the 80s. And this particular song is just so unusual. It's about a train travelling through the Tunisian desert to Tozza. Um And they just stood there on the stage in Luxembourg and just sang down the camera with no performance whatsoever. And it's just amazing. I just love the synths on it. I just love the, 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 the lyrics are just, yeah, bizarre. I mean, it's just very un-Eurovision. If you think that Diggy Lou Diggy Lay was the winner that year, um, it just, it's very of its time um, in terms of commercially that, of that era in Italian music. And it's great that someone like Battiato went to Eurovision because it was seen, you know, relatively prestigiously um, as a prestigious thing for, for an Italian artist to do then. And loads of big Italian artists were being sent to Eurovision. And it was following the standard Sanremo winner... Straight. I don't think. I think by that point they weren't sending the San Remo winners. I think um, Battiato and Alice mm-hmm. had, had both done San Remo many times. Alice had won, I think, two years earlier. I'm not quite sure, but yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the th- that time they weren't sending the winner, but they were they were there were big names that were going. Albano and Romina Power, who went twice, they'd won San Remo uh, a few years, but they never they weren't sending the winner of San Remo, um, but they were sending big artists to Eurovision. And this, I just think, is a wonderful emotion. It's got that opera in it, which is a bit of Mozart sung in German, and then the—it's just bizarre. It's just a wonderful combination. If you listen to Battiato's other work, it's a bit like what happened to Scott Walker in his later years. It's sort of a bit avant-garde and a bit crazy. But I just love Italian pop, and I love Italian being sung because it's very mellifluous and it lends itself so well. And the Italian Eurovision songs were so m- m- melodic. So uh, yeah, this is just—I just love listening to it. I never get tired of it. And it has that 
classic mid 80s synth sound. Yeah, which I love. And it was around a lot at Eurovision. It wasn't necessarily rewarded so much in the mid 80s. Um, which is a shame because that was the contemporary sound of the 80s. But again, possibly the orchestra at the time didn't lend, you know, having an orchestra didn't lend the, the contest the, you know, the chance to be as modern as, as possible. And I think that's uh, why some of these songs, I think it came sixth in the end. But um, it could have been possibly uh, higher if maybe it wasn't reliant on an orchestra or, yeah, or maybe they perform, they, they performed it a little bit more excitingly. But they deliberately went there, I think, to do it in a way that was very static and the interesting thing is putting that art pop on stage and the fact that it's given three minutes just like anybody else to do whatever yeah and then that's i I think it was it was an anti-performance and we've seen a lot of that afterwards haven't we from various countries but maybe this was the first time there was some some sort of yeah we're not going to jump around on stage in golden shoes uh, but then they didn't win, so maybe that's what you have to do in yeah. Eurovision in the 80s. But I, I love it, I think it's great, um, and I just love the melody, and I love the fact that it's just quite a bizarre song that was, I don't think, written for Eurovision at all, And but great that it was sent. OK, well, all aboard that train. Accepted. <laughs> now we'll move on to your most modern record in the selection. Um, we It's Casey Toller's Carry Me In Your Dreams, Yes. Now, this 2009, this was uh, quite a contest, Moscow, for those of us who got to go. Um, I went, I was working at the time in the Netherlands for the Dutch World Service, and I got to go uh, to do some reports um, for the programme I was working on. But I wasn't allowed to go for the full uh, week, so I had to fund myself for a few days, and then uh, my work would pay. So I was staying in this awful hotel in Moscow for a few days with pipes running down the walls and the most terrible bed. And then I got to move to the Holiday Inn, which was great. So my memories of Moscow, I didn't go there loving this song at all, but I, I didn't want to spend any time in this grotty hotel. So I was a, lot, a lot of my time was in the press centre. And if I remember right, they had the songs of that year on the loop all day long in the press centre. And this was just one of those songs that I kept hearing again and again and again. And of course it had that ridiculous performance with the, the turquoise gimp, glitter gimp. And it was just brilliantly staged and just very catchy and, and very upbeat and it just stuck. And it wasn't the song that I sort of loved before I went, but it was just, it's just the song that reminds me of Moscow, the grandioseness of the Moscow Eurovision, the, the, you know, the enormous arena, the enormous stage. And yeah, it's just got a great, uh, again, I love, I love melody and this has got a great tune. It's, the melody line is so interesting because it's got quite a lot of slightly gothic um, intervals uh, in, in the chorus melody and that minor tone, which when you've got a pink princess and the turquoise, turquoise, gimp. turquoise morph man, <laughs> glitter morph man yes. as well, um, it, it sort of doesn't quite marry up. but. No. But they, it all works, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And I just and I just love the way it was staged, and all the songs that year were staged incredibly. They all that stage really lent itself well to. They managed to use the stage well in all the songs, um, but this just stuck with me. And I think it's also got the slight Balkan sound in it, the instrumentation, and I like that at Eurovision where you can hear a little bit of the culture in mm-hmm. the song. And that's coming back now, I think. But it just, um, yeah, you can hear it's it's it's. It, it's not a song that you would hear elsewhere. It's, I think this sort of thing was written to be a, a competition song at Eurovision, but I just love it. I, just, it. I mean, it's a great song to dance to as well. Uh, and, yeah, it just reminds me of Moscow and, the, and that time um, at that what was the, the biggest Eurovision, I think, up to that date. And it, and, and it kind of lends itself to that, the, the actual hugeness of this song and the, the rhythm of it all. Was this a Festival of Congress winner? Yes, but I think, as with so many of those, it didn't sound like this when it won. No. And then it was really souped up afterwards. I don't think it was in English originally either. It, they really did a, did a number on it and made it a very different song, I think, actually. Yeah, the, the process of waiting for what Albania actually send is one of the sort of slow burn tense moments of the Eurovision season. I think they've done quite well in the 2018 revamp mm, yeah. by not really doing anything at all mm. to the song. But they famously did, I think, for many years, take a song that wasn't anything like 
Eurovision friendly if you want and then the really uh, added production and this was one of them that really changed I think between winning and, and going to Eurovision uh, and yeah love it it reminds me of that that particular time and uh, that was a, I, I really enjoyed that the Moscow Eurovision it was it was very interesting well we'll accept that up next your third record we have Vicky Leandros representing Luxembourg in 1972 with Après Toi now, for a lot of people, Vicky Leandros in the spotlight, on her own, singing Après Toi for Luxembourg, is what Eurovision looks like. Yes, and certainly in that period where French songs were winning, it was English or French, um, this was the Eurovision chanson, yeah, the typical Eurovision chanson. For me, I picked this one because I, it's the only winner on my list, and it's one of the, in the, growing up, um, watching Eurovision without the internet in the 80s, th- there was not really a way of accessing a lot of the songs um, or hearing them. And I used to listen a lot to Radio 1 and Pick of the Pops with Alan Freeman. And there was always, you know, when you got to the weeks of April and May from certain years, you would hear songs that had been in Eurovision or won Eurovision from, from the 1970s. And, and this was one of them. And it was also on a compilation Reader's Digest tape collection that my dad used to subscribe to Reader's Digest. So we had lots of 70s tape and 60s tape collections. And it was on there as Come What May, which was the English version, which I think was a number two hit. Um, and it's also, I chose it because my mum loves this song. And it was... Partly through my mum, I got into Eurovision because um, she loved Nicole's A Little Piece. So I was debating whether to take Nicole or Vicky to the Ile de Besançon, song. But I decided on Vicky because I think it's a better song. But she loved A Little Piece and she bought Nicole's album. Ooh. So we used to listen to that on holidays and driving around the car. So that was my first sort of Eurovision memory, uh, is Nicole and A Little Piece and, and her particular album. But Vicky Leandros is another favourite of my mum, she loves this song, and I w- thought I should take this because it would always remind me of my my mother. And it's a great song. It's gr- well, written by Greeks um, for Luxembourg, um, and just it's that great mix of Eurovision nations coming together to make a you know a great song as well. That's Eurovision, exactly. Yeah. What was it, what has it been like going from the sort of pre-internet Eurovision scarcity era mm. through to the modern era of interconnectedness, permanently available music, being able to uh, like do the communication that has brought fandom together as it is? I, I suppose it's just it, the wonderful thing about yeah, growing up without all that is that it was just, you had to really search for things. And I used to go to record shops on a Saturday morning and find singles. And, you know, if you've heard a song on the radio, you'd have to go and buy it as a 45 and whatever. And I suppose going through all that and now it, everything is easily accessible. It's, I think it's for Eurovision itself, it's made it a much more um, yeah, interconnected event. It, it's brought much, many more countries together. And before where you just had to, you know, in the... In the you could only communicate via the sort of fanzines and stuff like that, you know, that were desktop publishing. And, and now the internet, yeah, has really revolutionised it. And it's and if you want to find a song now, you can just find it on YouTube. You can watch whole contests, you know. And, uh, and that is a great thing to do in the off-season. Yeah, and it's a wonderful thing that it just means the whole history is there for everybody uh, in a way that it wasn't there before. And, you'd, and you can discover things much more easily. You don't have to wait for some radio station to play it, or as it was back then. So, um, or recording this song contest, or trying to find them online. And well, that was in, you know in the early days of eBay, mm. you could suddenly find contests. You could find them, you know, and buy them off eBay. Which, of course, I would not uh, advocate working for the EBU now that, uh, that any piracy it takes place whatsoever. But back then, that's you know, you, you couldn't see the old contests either. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah, it all changed now. Yeah, and the other good thing now is that um, a lot of these things and even national finals are being archived, mm. whereas previously, uh, you know, as light entertainment, it was not seen as like a serious cultural document and mm-hmm. ephemeral. Mm-hmm. And now these things are being digitally archived. I think people are going to know a lot more about you know the sort of social construction of pop music and you know just what people watched on tv from the fact that there's going to be so much more data absolutely but yes the upshot of all this is that we will certainly allow vicky leandros 
onto Ilda Besançon. She'll be thrilled. Accept it. Yep. For your fourth record, we're going back to the 80s. Uberdi Brook again. It's Ingrid Peters for Germany. Again, another synth classic from the mid-80s that did reasonably well, didn't win. But Germany at that time was sort of sending these sort of peace anthems like For Allah, uh, Wind in 85, and this was 86. And I just love, again, the, the real 80s sound on this. And it was, yeah, a really great tune. I mean, I, didn't, I don't remember watching the 86 contest. The first memory I have of Eurovision is really watching uh, 87, 88, Johnny Logan... And then Scott Fitzgerald coming second to Celine Dion. But, but later I discovered this song. And again, I just love certain languages lend themselves to certain music. And sometimes German, Dutch doesn't really work for ballads, but it works for pop and power pop and something with a heavy synth. And I think this song, you know, works much better in German than it does in English. It did, it, there's all, they, back then they used to do the versions in different languages. Um, but I just love this because I just love the synth in it. I love the sound of it. And uh, I love the way Ingrid, yeah, in there she was, you know, the epitome of the mid 80s and a glittery top and a big hair. The, her silver lame dress and power suit combination mm. with that incredible hairspray mullet <laughs> standing next to uh, hexagonal synth drums. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, with a guy playing a sort of a guitar thing on the other side. Just, the 80s were not like that where I came from, but that's, that's for a lot of people, the 80s in a single television image. Yes, yeah. and, there was, and there was the glamour as well, and yeah, I just think it's, yeah, really, it's a really good song. And I think at that time, and I love the socio-political elements to, to the Eurovision and the history and the, you know, how... how the song contest has mirrored and reflected and also anticipated changes in Europe. I'm very into that side of the, the contest. And Germany around that period of the 80s were, were doing these peace songs. Um, and it was only just a few years before the, the Berlin Wall. It was obviously, it was West Germany. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you know, indicative of this sort of like yearning, which was coming through out through Eurovision, of, of wanting peace and wanting, uh, you know, and, and obviously the post-war... Uh, you know, um, what's the word? Sort of um, uh, Germany's role changing after the the war and and, and desperate to be accepted back into international uh, the international community. So a lot of these Eurovision songs, I think, reflected that, particularly around that era. You are starting to get a little tiny bit of a type in these records. We've got a lot of strong female vocals. Going ah, on. well, I hadn't really thought about that so much. Um, it's funny because Alice in the first record, in uh, I thought when I first heard records by her, she's got a really deep voice. She sort of alternates between singing uh, high and low, and I thought she was uh, the bits she was singing were actually the Franco Battiato bits. So, um, and another, another song they did together where she really sounds like a man. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's always that diva thing going on at Eurovision mm -hmm. and, and the strong female voice, but I think it's. Uh, it's the songs. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, it wasn't deliberate, shall we say. Yeah, I mean, it, you can't say really that any of these are all in the same genre, but there's, there's a sort of a common thread. Oh, okay, yes. subconsciously. Yes, so yeah. let's accept that and let's go next door. Ik wil alles met je delen. The Netherlands, 1990, and it's Maywood. Now, this is an interesting choice. Um... Again, going back to that, how you got hold of Eurovision songs in the pre-internet days, I remember in the early 90s, and I was in my uh, mid-teens, uh, the only way you could hear Eurovision songs was either the radio or, uh, for me, or there was a few CDs out there which you could buy. And there was one particular CD, and I've forgotten what it's called now, but it had some recent hits and some classics on there. And on that CD was Maywood's Dutch 1990 entry. And I watched the Dutch. Uh, I watched the 1990 contest, but it, that song didn't particularly stand out at the time. But a few years later, when I had this CD, it did. And again, it's a song that works nicely in Dutch. It's, it is a ballad, but it's a power ballad. Um, and it, yeah, I just love the me again the melody. And um, <laughs> I've never admitted this publicly, but at the time, um, and I think everybody who loves Eurovision has possibly done this. Um, I thought 
oh, wouldn't it be great to add some English lyrics to this? Because it's got a great melody, but I don't know what they're singing about. Because at the time, I couldn't even Google translate it. So I've no idea what they were singing about. So I added my own lyrics to it at the age of 14, 15. And the Ikvil Alas Metyudeyan became I Will Never Forget My Summer Love. And the chorus was about, was about <laughs> I, can never, no, I will never forget my summer love, my European heart, how it beats across the continent as my journey starts. And then it continued in the same way as uh, Somewhere in Europe, which was the same year for Ireland, where it's a travel log around Europe, going around looking for my summer love. And that was the lyrics I added to this song. Maywood never knew, and I never recorded it either. But, uh, and I don't even know what the rest of the lyrics were now, but yeah. That's what I did. Listeners. Lock me up. You ought to see my face. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great song. And then later on, um, at, actually it was well, after the Amsterdam party one year, a few years ago, they were playing a song and I shazammed it. So again, look at how different technology is now. And I didn't know the song. And it turned out to be Maywood and their big hits that they had in the early 80s called Late at Night, which has the most incomprehensible, ludicrous English lyrics that mean nothing. But it's a great tune. So they did some really good tunes, Maywood. Very naff. And very different, their early 80s stuff, from what they did at Eurovision. What do we know about Maywood? Well, I think they were... I don't... I'm not sure. Hang on, let me wiki them. There's yeah. another thing that we can do now that you would never have been able to do. As far as I'm aware, now they're, they're not sisters, but they sort of masqueraded as sisters, and they fell out, possibly after their Eurovision appearance, and and they didn't speak again for a long time. But then they had they did reform, so they had performed recently together. But they were huge in the early '80s in the Netherlands and possibly in other countries around Germany um, as well. But um, I think that was their comeback uh, in 1990, okay. quite possibly anyway. Fair enough. Well, it is a bit of a cracker, so we will accept it. Excellent. Now on to 2018 contest hosts, Portugal, and their 1989 song, Conquistador by Da Vinci. Tell us about your favourite Portuguese song. <laughs> well, this I love, again, because I love the... the the, the other elements of Eurovision, not just the music, but the whole event, the whole European side of it, you know, the whole bringing the continent together, the whole socio-political elements of the song contest. And this particular song, I, I, didn't, I don't remember it from 89 particularly. My memory of 89 was um, Reva winning um, and Bana Bana, the Turkish song of that year. But this, which I discovered later, just amuses me. And, I, and again, great melody. I love melody in, in songs. Um, but just, I just love the gall of this song because it's just about Portugal's colonial history and being conquerors. And it just, and it was a huge hit in Portugal. I've got a very good Portuguese friend who who um, also likes Eurovision, and she said this was, you know, she used to dance to this when they were kids. It was a huge hit. But I just love the gall of going to Eurovision and singing about conquering and invading countries in a way that I don't think Britain would have ever done at Eurovision or many or France. I mean, if Britain would never have shown up singing a song of we went to Egypt and uh, in India and Australia and sing in the way in this Whoa, sort of, it, the yeah, Elgin Marbles. Exactly. Oh my God, imagine how that would go down. I know. Or oh, France, you know, we were in Tunisia, we were in Morocco and, and there in the 1980s singing about how these, you know, in the post-colonial era, singing about how wonderful. And Portugal still has that, you know, even now with the contest this year, there's still this theme of the oceans and the travelling and, it, and it's not seen in Portugal as being particularly controversial. But I think in other countries, this that the colonial history would not be something celebrated in a song. And, I just love the fact it is being <laughs> with these lyrics in such a jaunty, <laughs> you know, camp way. Yeah. <laughs> You're speechless. <laughs> yes. Well, when, when I did look at the lyrics, because obviously I've been learning Portuguese in 2018, mm -hmm. I did go, is that what? Oh, that's, well, exactly, yeah. exactly. Crikey! <laughs> and I wonder whether if, if it was being sent now, it would go, it would uh, clear the political message rule. I don't know. You know, the state making a political statement. Is it making a political statement? I'm not sure. Well, I've read the wording of that rule, and you could rule anything in or out, mm -hmm. depending on mm -hmm. you know whether you were feeling nicely inclined on that on that day. Yeah, and I think I think actually it was not well rewarded in 89. I think looking at the songs in 89, it should have done better. 
and a, and it was a huge Portuguese hit, and it's great. It's a go, it's a really good tune, and it's very good for geography as well. If you want to know about Portugal's colonial history, and for that educational aspect, <laughs> Conquistador is accepted. <laughs> it's so dodgy. It's so dodgy. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, gosh. Right, your seventh record. We have Amina for France, 1991, with La Denia Qui a Palais for France. Ah, yes. Well, I love this song, and this was the year that I really began to love Eurovision. I'd watched it for a few years as a kid while my mum was ironing on a Saturday night and, and, and enjoyed it. But 91 was the year of Toto and Giuliola, of course, in Rome the famous 91 contest. And this was the year when I just thought, yeah, this is amazing Eurovision. This is a great event. This is watching, you know, 22, 23 different countries singing in their own languages, watching the same TV show, uh, uniting everyone, feeling part of something live, and anything can happen, and did happen. Of course, with Mr. Neff, Mr. Neff, the voting was amazing. I mean, just brilliant. And, I, and, and a few years, uh, a couple of years ago, um, I had the honour of interviewing Frank Neff, who uh, was, of course, the scrutineer for many years of the song contest in, in Geneva. He's, he's still living in Geneva, still very well, plays tennis regularly, 83, 84 years old. And, and, I, and I had this moment, which was one of my career highlights, where I sat watching highlights of Frank Neff's voting from 91, of Toto, and him interrupting with, with him. And, he, and it was years ago, and... He, and he was just watching his face, and sat, and I said, you know, were you not just furious during that particular, you know, time? That was just, and he was like, well, you know, it was, it was all right, and and I thought, it's amazing that I'd watched this for so many years, and that particular contest I just absolutely loved because it all went wrong, and and there was Toto going, Portugal two points, and and you've got um, Frank going Switzerland, Switzerland, and it's just. That was the moment I thought, this is brilliant television. And then, of course, you had, at the end of the voting, the, the, uh, the uh, tie, which couldn't have been better at the end of what had been quite a chaotic Eurovision. But then there was a tie that Mr Neff had to sort out. And um, I loved both the songs, but at the time, I was, I was much more, uh, you know, Team Amina because I thought it was quite exotic and it was just really beautiful and quite unusual. And then I remember after the contest, a few weeks later, I went uh, into, you know, when I used to be buying 45 singles and went to buy some singles and this was there. They released it in the UK. And on the 45, on the sleeve, it said, a little on a stamp, the other Eurovision Song Contest winner. Ooh. Yeah, so it was being marketed as the rightful, or mm. we both won. Um, so that's why I chose this, because it, that was the year that I really you know, consolidated my, my love for this event. And it's a, it's a really great song. And that time again, France was sending those s songs that were reminiscent of, their, of the, the, the different countries that they, uh, that they also colonised, if you want to use that word. But the year before was Serge Gainsbourg's White and Black Blues. So they were doing that very ethnic thing. Um, before it became very popular, about 10 years later. This song, with minor production updates, could be competing in 2018. Yeah, it's pretty timeless. Yeah. It's pretty timeless and very, yeah, really nice. Again, great melody. Um, and again, love the rhythms of the, love the, the whiff of a souk, as Terry Wogan would say. I do like a whiff of a souk. A little, a little whiff. Of course, we're all Team Amina on Ile de Besançon, so accepted. Now it's time for your final record. <coughs> and we have Iceland's 2003 representative, Birgitta, with Open Your Heart. Yes, Open Your Heart opened the 2003 Eurovision. And this was the second one I'd gone to. 98 was my first Eurovision in Birmingham. And I'd applied for tickets. Uh, at the time I was living in Glasgow, I was at university, and applied for tickets. I think it was done like Wimbledon in some sort of lottery. And I, if I'm not mistaken, about two weeks before the 98 Eurovision they arrived. I didn't even know, you know. And it, again, 
slightly pre-internet. You couldn't sort of buy them online. And then I just, they arrived. So I was going to Birmingham in two weeks' time, which was a great experience. But, and then the next time I went was, was Riga because I wanted to go, always wanted to go to the Baltics, and I thought this was a great opportunity. A friend of mine had just moved to Sweden. She was with a Swedish guy who she's now married to. And we went to Melody Festival in Sweden that year. Um, and, and she was trying to immerse herself in Swedish culture and I thought, well, this could be quite interesting. And then it was like a mini Eurovision Song Contest, Melody Festival, and, and I thought, wow, this happens in another country. It's like, you know, a pre-Eurovision Eurovision. And we went to Latvia, her and I. Um, I met her in Tallinn. She got the boat from Stockholm to Tallinn. And I went to Helsinki first and then met her in Tallinn. And she made this enormous flag supporting the Swedish entry of that year. And it said Latvia, Give Me Your Love, the Swedish song. So we went there supporting Sweden. But when we were in Riga, this song I kept hearing, because they were playing all the songs in, in restaurants. And again, because of the only Eurovision I'd been to before was Birmingham, um, and it was a fairly low-key affair, and I found it quite disappointing, because I thought there'd be a bit of an atmosphere, which you have now at Eurovision. But in Birmingham, you, you didn't even notice it was on. But in Riga, they were really going for it, and you, the city was really alive with Eurovision. And I kept hearing Open Your Heart, um, and back then I wasn't really listening to the other songs before the contest, even though you could get them. Um, and this I just really stuck in my head. I love the lyrics to it. It sounded contemporary at the time. Um, yeah, and I just... It, it, it reminds me of Riga. I mean, of course, the Gemini experience was quite entertaining as well, wandering through the streets afterwards with British flags as well as the, the Swedish thing that we had. Um, and Latvia, I think, would come second last, so... Uh, there was no, you know, the, we were being mocked by the locals, but you know, they really had no room to do that. But Open Your Heart was the one uh, that I rem just remember hearing and thinking, this is amazing, it's coming out of shops. People are playing Eurovision songs in shops. This city, you know, has really embraced this. This is how it should be. Um, and so that's why, yeah, Open Your Heart, I still like it. It, it sounds of its time, it, I thought it could have won. Maybe it hadn't gone first, it would have done, I don't know. But really good, really, I love the song. And again, really good performance as well on the stage. First, going first, really good show opener, but not a deliberate show opener, obviously. And for fantastic memories of what sounds like an epic trip. <laughs> it was. Accepted. Now it's time for the big surprise, your Eurovision luxury. What are you bringing with us? Well, I had to think a bit hard about this, um, and in the end I decided I would bring, uh, controversially for this year possibly, an LED screen. Oh, good grief. <laughs> you, can't, you can't get more Eurovision, although possibly in Portugal this year you can, than an LED screen. Because it's been very much emblematic and symbolic of, of the growth of the, the Eurovision stage and the, the, the show over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and I think an LED screen would be very useful on the island because I can then watch other uh, Eurovision songs and various uh, other bits of television. It would keep me entertained if I had a big LED screen. Yeah, I think that's a useful addition to the community. We can mm. all watch other performances. Yeah, okay. and, and I do like, you know, I do like uh, to uh, to be online. I do like, you know, need constant stimulation. And I do need visual stimulation. Uh, and I would need that on a desert island, I think. Otherwise, I'd feel a bit isolated. So the LED screen would help provide that. And we can do uh, sort of karaoke dance-along performances of Mons Elmo's Heroes with it. Well, quite. Exactly. It's, it's multi-purpose, and that's why I think it should be there. Well, fair enough. Uh, so are there any of your records that you'd like to uh, give a sort of traditional honorary douze poids to? Any particular favourite? Uh, yeah, it's going to have to be the first one. I, I, I de Tuzer, Franco Battiato and Elice, because that is just, yeah, I'll never get tired of listening to that. Um, so that is my douze poids. Well, I'm not going to call you pretentious, but I'm not going to not call you pretentious. <laughs> It's the only man on the list, Franco. That's true. You That's pointed that out. I wasn't aware, but Franco is the only man there. That is true. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are some men standing around in the background, but yeah, it's but all about the count. divas, really. Yeah. Um, so before we send you and your records in your LED screen off to enjoy the island, is there anything you'd like to plug, promote, tell us about? Uh, let's assume we're all going to be watching the Eurovision Song Contest. Well, exactly. I mean, that, that's, what, that's what we're all here, going to be in Lisbon for. No, I mean, it's, it's going to be great. Uh, Lisbon is going to be an amazing host city. 
I, I think many of us who followed Eurovision for many years are so pleased that Portugal finally won. And I remember going to Lisbon years ago and going round that park, the old Expo Park, where the, the arena is this year, thinking this would be a wonderful location for Eurovision. But it ain't ever going to happen. And it finally did. And that is the joy of Eurovision and why I'm so privileged and proud to work on it for the EBU is that it travels, it brings everyone together and everyone meets somewhere different every year. Or they come to London for the pre-party or Amsterdam or Tel Aviv. And, it, and it's a, an amazing force for good. Um, and Lisbon is going to be brilliant because it, it, it's going to a place that really adores the contest and really deserves to be hosting it. And that's what's great for, a, particularly for the EBU, but just for all of us who love the contest to be somewhere that's going to really embrace having it and provide two amazing weeks fantastic stuff so thank you very much Dave Goodman for joining us on Ilda Besançon thank you very much for inviting me this has been Ellie Chalkley presenting Eurovision Castaways for ESC Insight and now those guitars <laughs> <laughs>